In this video, we will be demonstrating solutions to the QCE Mathematical Methods Technology Active Sample Assessment Paper 2. In this session, we'll be using the TI-84 Plus CE Calculator. So let's get started. Question 1. Students should recognise that a logarithmic function has a vertical asymptote. This particular example includes a translation of the function parallel to the x-axis. However, students may be confused by the different base, so it's appropriate to take a moment to check. I'll start by entering the function in the y equals editor. You can use alpha and f2 to access commonly used mathematical templates. Select the log function, enter base 3 and the expression x plus 5. I could set window dimensions manually, However, the automatic zoom decimal setting is appropriate for this function and is a time efficient solution. We can see that the function appears to be approaching a vertical line. The screen resolution prevents us from seeing more detail. However, we can draw a vertical line at x equals negative 5 to get further visual confirmation that the equation to the asymptote is indeed at x equals negative 5. Based on this information, I'll select option A. Question 2. The population of bacteria after t hours is given by a function p of t. We're asked to find the rate of increase of the population at t equals 15 minutes. So, some important things to consider here. We're asked for the rate of increase, which is dp dt, and also the function refers to t as hours, and yet we're asked to find it after 15 minutes. So, I'll use the math menu, and I'll select numerical derivative, and I'll put my variable t, and we'll enter the function 5000 e to the power of 0 0.18 t. And I'll set t equal to 15 over 60 and I see the answer is 941 so I'll select option D question 3 using the trapezoidal rule with four sections determine the approximate area under the curve y equals x squared plus 5 between x equals 0 and x equals 2 the calculator does have the ability to determine a definite integral, but the question specifically asks for the trapezoidal rule. We can see by the diagram that the two areas or the two results would be very similar. The multiple choice options validate this. So let's try and understand the trapezoidal rule. It's the averaging of a series of left bound and right bound rectangles. The heights of the left bound rectangles correspond to f of 0, f of 0 0.5, f of 1, and f of 1.5, each with a width of a half. The right bound rectangles have heights f of 0 0.5, f of 1, f of 1.5, and f of 2, again, all with a width of 0 0.5. So, now that we have an understanding of the calculations, let's get stuck into them. The first thing I'll do is set the x values from 0 through to 1.5 in list 1. We'll use this list to calculate the value of the function at 0, 0 0.5, 1 and 1.5. I'll clear out the old equation in the y equals editor and enter in x squared plus 5. I can now calculate the sum of the areas 0 0.5 being the width and y1 of each of the x values which are stored in list 1. So we see the area of the left bound rectangles is 11.75. I can now adjust list 1 by 0 0.5 and therefore calculate the heights of the right bound rectangles. The trapezoidal rule is just the average of these two. So I'll sum up 11.75 and 13.75 
divide them by 2 to get an answer of 12.75, which is option B. Question 4. We are asked to find the area bounded by the two curves, y equals x root x plus 1 and y equals 2x. To answer this question, you need to know the boundaries of the region. This requires us to find where the graphs intersect one another. It should be clear that the graphs intersect when x equals 0. To locate other points of intersection, I'll graph the two functions. I'll select Zoom Standard and then adjust the window settings to get a better look. As expected, the graphs intersect at x equals 0. To locate the second point of intersection, use the Calculate menu by pressing Second Function and Trace. Select Intersect. Press Enter to select the first graph and again to select the second. Move the cursor close to the point of intersection and press Enter once more. We can see the two graphs intersect at x equals 3. So, to calculate the area bounded between the two curves, subtract the area bounded by the lower from the area bounded by the upper. Return to the Calculate menu and select Integral. Starting with Y1, we'll enter 0 as the left bound and 3 as the right bound. The area below the first graph is 7.733. Go to the Home screen and select Answer to paste this value. Now return to the graph screen and calculate the area bounded by the second graph. Use the down arrow to navigate to the second graph and calculate the area bounded by this curve between 0 and 3. We see that the area is 9. So, the area between the two curves can be calculated by finding the difference. And we see the area is approximately 1.266. So I'll select option A. Question 5. Two particles move along the x-axis for a period of 5 seconds with their respective positions defined by x1 of t and x2 of t. We are asked to find how many times the particles have the same position. To answer this question, graph the two functions. We could restrict the domain but for this question, it will be more efficient to simply adjust the window settings. Notice that we are asked to find how many times particles intersect, not when or where. From the graph, we can see that the two particles are at the same point on four separate occasions. So I'll select option A. Question 6. The side lengths of a triangle are in the ratio 2 is to 3 is to 4. We are required to find the smallest angle in this triangle. The first thing we need to know is that the angles in a triangle are invariant as the triangle is dilated. The second thing we need to know is that the smallest angle will be opposite the shortest side. It's also important to realise that all the answers provided are in degrees. So, before proceeding, it's a good idea to change the calculator mode into degrees. Now, to answer this question, I'll use the cosine rule. You could transpose and substitute. Alternatively, I'll use the solve command in the maths menu. For the left-hand side of my equation, I'll just enter a squared. For the right-hand side, I'll enter b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cos d. This is the cosine rule, but I've used d rather than a as the angle since the calculator does not distinguish between upper and lower case letters. Enter the values for a, b and c and solve for d. We get an answer of 28.9 degrees. Option C. Question 7. The graph of the function x cubed minus 6x squared is concave down when? A function is concave downward when the second derivative is negative. 
The calculator can't solve for a range of values, but we can use a graph. So in y1, I'll enter the original function, x cubed minus 6x squared. In y2, I'll graph the derivative of that function for all values of x. In y3, I'll graph the numerical derivative of y2, that is, the second derivative of y1. We can see from the graph that the second derivative is linear, as we should expect, and it appears to be negative for x less than 2. We can quickly check this value using the calculate command. So, the correct answer is option C. Question 8. A particle travels along a straight line with a velocity given by V of t. We are required to determine the acceleration of the particle when t equals 2. Acceleration is given by dV dt, so we need to find the derivative of V with respect to t. In a previous question we set our calculator to degrees. And as we are working with calculus and trigonometry, we need to change back to radians. When we work out the derivative, you can use x as the variable to speed things up a little. However, I'll demonstrate here that you can use t as the variable simply by using the alpha key. We calculate the numerical derivative of our function. When t equals 2, and we get an answer of approximately negative 1.03. So we'll select the correct answer as option A. Question 9. The birth mass of babies is normally distributed with a mean of 3,500 grams and a standard deviation of 500. We're required to find the probability that the birth mass of a baby is less than 3,200 grams. We can see our normal distribution, and the red shaded area corresponds to the area that we require. To calculate this probability, use the distribution menu and select normal cumulative density function. Enter the lower bound, 0, the upper bound, 3200, followed by the mean and standard deviation. We get a probability of approximately 0 0.274, which is option D. Question 10. A survey found that 142 people out of 200, aged between 30 and 39, have some form of tertiary qualification. We are required to determine a 95% confidence interval for the actual proportion of the population in this same age group that have a tertiary qualification. To answer this question, we need to understand that our sample represents a point estimate of the true proportion, and that these point estimates are approximately normally distributed around the true mean, assuming the necessary conditions regarding sampling have been met. In other words, our sample may be a good or poor estimate of the actual mean. We just don't know. But we can determine an interval over which we will be 95% confident that the true population mean or proportion lies. We are provided with a proportion for just one sample, so we use a one proportion test and the normal distribution. To determine my confidence interval, I'll select STAT, arrow across to Tests, then arrow down to choose one proportion Z interval. I'll enter the observed value of 142 and the quantity of people 200 and the default confidence interval of 0.95. We see the confidence interval is 0.647 to 0.772 so I'll select option C. That's all for the multiple choice questions in this sample paper. Keep watching to see some of our keyboard shortcuts 
and be sure to check out our other videos including part 2 of this sample paper.